Good morning, everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here this morning who is worshiping with us. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge anyone who may be joining us online for worship this morning or sometime during the week ahead. I also want to give a shout out to our young people who are joining us, uh, who are home for vacation, for summer vacation, um, and are here with us this morning. Um, and anybody else who may be visiting with us either for the first time or joining us over their summer vacation, um, we welcome you all this morning. As you can see, those of you who are regulars, uh, the person who is on the keyboard this morning is not Brad. For those of you who are awake and observant this morning, and I would also like to say a very special welcome and thank you to Antonio, who uh, holds up the music ministry at Elmsley and has kindly agreed to join us um, this morning. And he'll, you'll see him again in August, as our own Mr. Brad is currently enjoying his own vacation and a well-deserved one visiting family and friends in Jamaica. John 4 and 24 reminds us that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I invite those of you who are able and would like to, to stand as we read together our call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 145, verses 10 to 18, that also reminds us that the Lord is near to all who call on him in truth. Please stand if you're able to. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Amen. As we gather together this morning, let us still the busyness and noisiness of everyday life and focus our hearts and minds on the beauty and wonder of praising God as we sing together when I look into your holiness.
We have a number of announcements this morning. Some of them will be on the screen, some are not. Uh, so I'll try to go through these uh, as quickly as I can. Um, we have a number of prayer requests uh, and one more to add to that uh, this morning. So Carolyn Jervis uh, is a teacher, a, a member of the staff at Little Trotters. Um, that's a preschool and our own Joanna Boxall uh, is involved in that. Um, she has recently been diagnosed with cancer uh, and she messaged Joanna uh, this week, I think. Uh, and she said, please ask your church family to pray. I need this more than anything right now. So that's Carolyn Jervis, and we certainly will lift her up in, in prayers as she goes through a very challenging time. Uh, Sophia Tobut, as we recall, is also going through some, a number of medical issues, so we continue to lift her up. Um, Clive, you all that are regulars here at South Sound United will know uh, that Clive is usually here, he's usually the first one here in the morning, uh, working away before we all get here. Um, he's actually traveling, I think he left yesterday. Uh, he has gone to the US where his daughter and granddaughter Amelia are. Uh, they are hopeful, if you recall, she has been there since birth, uh, Amelia has been. Uh, most of the time in hospital. Uh, they are hopeful that he, when he returns in August, uh, Catherine, his daughter, and Amelia, his granddaughter, will be coming home with them for the first time in over a year. And so we certainly lift them up in prayers as the doctors continue to minister to them and hopefully get them to the stage where they can come home. Uh, we also want to continue to remember the search committee um, who has in the process of being appointed under Reverend Yvette's leadership um, and will be starting the search for a new minister for us and for the John Gray congregation. Bible study continues on Wednesday. That's a, uh, via Zoom at 7 p.m. Uh, the current study continues on Ecclesiastes. Um, the login information is in the weekly newsletter. If you don't receive that and would like to, please see Sheila, who is seated at the back, is raising her hand, um, so that you can get on that email list and get the information uh, for the church. Vacation Bible School, I think this is the last one that is going to be offered through our church. That starts tomorrow uh, through the week, and it's at Elmsley and it's taking place from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the evenings. Uh, we talked about this, I think, last week. Uh, there's an opportunity for us to sponsor um, a child or children in Haiti through the organization called Gospel Growers uh, for 200 uh, Cayman dollars, and I think that is about 240 U.S. Um, for the year that ensures that a child receives an education and hears the, go and hears the gospel. If you're interested in donating, uh, they will be sending those um, donations over in August, um, ahead of the school year that begins. You can do that either by placing your donation in an envelope in the offering box, which is just inside the entrance to our sanctuary, um, or by direct deposit, and the information for that is also in the weekly newsletter. The basket, um, and I will be honest with you, we've been talking about this for a number of uh, months now, and I had to go back and say, can you remind me again, what are these items going towards? Um, so if you've forgotten, you're not alone. Um, these are contributions that are going to the Young Families Outreach Program that our sister church um, at John Gray in West Bay, um, are there, they manage. Uh, items being collected for July and August if you recall, for July, it was canned pasta or soup or cups of noodles, those types of things. Um, for August, uh, they're asking for granola bars or similar snack packs. So as you go to the store this week and you'd like to contribute to that um, outreach program, those are the items that are being asked for. Before we get to birthdays, um, we have one other request or not request, but one other announcement, and that is uh, we are going to be having, uh, in honor of 
anyone who might be worshiping with us for the summer, uh, summer holidays, our young people, we'll be having after service next Sunday, coffee and nibbles. So we'll invite you to stay and fellowship and meet some of our young people and visiting um, congregants over the summer. Uh, that's next Sunday, and Sheila will be organizing that for us. Uh, is there anything else that I've missed? Okay, so now we can go on to birthdays, and we have several uh, birthdays there. Uh, Patricia, who is uh, celebrating a birthday. We have, I don't think Patricia is here this morning. Um, we have Charlotte. Is Charlotte here this morning? Nope. Nope. Um, Miss Melva, you'll know, some of you will remember Miss Melva, who lives right uh, up the street from us. Um, she's also celebrating a birthday this week. Are there any other folks that might be with us that we don't have on our list? Aha, I knew there was somebody else. Happy birthday to you this week. Yes, and, and it's great to have you worshiping with us this morning. We don't have any anniversaries for the week, but again, are there any, is there anybody here who might be celebrating an anniversary this week that we don't have? All right. Um, Antonio, would you be able to raise a happy birthday for our birthday babies? stand once again if we're able to and join together in a song of praise as we sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Give me oil in my lamp. So this is our last opportunity. I'll invite you to raise your voices in praise as we sing. Give me love in my heart.
much better. Please be seated. I'll invite Miss Valerie to lead us in our family time. Good morning. Let me tell you a story this morning about a good friend of Jesus. This is Zacchaeus, Big Zac of Jericho, a little man with a big heart. And you might think, looking at this photograph, that he's always been very generous, but he hasn't. This is Zac's story. Let's go back to the start. Here's Zac's old school class photo. Can you see him? Yeah, down at the front. Zach didn't like school much. At lunchtime, he was never picked to play basketball. Uh, I'll have Dangerous Dave, Agile Aiden, and Incredible Iona. I'll have Jumping Josh, Airtime Ash, and Leaping Luke. You can have Zach. No, 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 no. You can have him. Zach, you can be scorer. But worst of all, and I know this maybe doesn't happen in your school, the kids used to tease Zach. They would point at him and sing, snorty, snorty, Zach says shorty. And then they would laugh because thinking they were very funny. This made Zach sad. Then he got mad. Then he decided to get even. He came up with a brilliant plan. Because he was always the scorer, he became very good with numbers. He said to the other kids, let me do your homework for you. For weeks, he did everyone's homework until no one could do it by themselves. Then he started charging 10 cents a sum. Soon, Zach had lots of money. No one liked him. But Zach didn't care. That's the story of Zach at school. When he grew up, he was so good with numbers that he became a tax collector. His job was to collect the money from all the people in Jericho and send it to the king. But Zach still wanted to get even with everyone who had sent, teased him at school. So he collected a little bit extra. One dollar for the king, two dollars for me. One dollar for the king, five dollars for me. One dollar for the king, ten dollars for me. One day, Jesus came to Jericho. Jack was so excited, he joined the crowd waiting for Jesus. He couldn't see. He tried jumping, but because he hadn't played basketball at school, he couldn't jump high enough to see Jesus. He tried pushing, but no one liked him, so they wouldn't let him in. And then Zach came up with a brilliant plan. He climbed up a tree. People pointed at Zach and sang, snorty, snorty, Zach is a shorty. Zach didn't care. He could see Jesus. Jesus came closer and closer, stopped right under Zach, looked up and said, Zach, hurry on down. I want to stay with you today. Zach no longer felt sad. He didn't feel mad or want to get even. Zach was happy. No one had ever picked him before. Everyone else was angry. Why did Jesus pick shorty, snorty, greedy Zach, they grumbled. Zach said to Jesus, I will give half my money to the people who are poor, and to everyone I cheated, I'll give them back four times as much as I took. Zach belongs to God's family, Jesus told the people. Hooray, said everyone. I've got a brilliant plan, said Jack. I'll treat you all for lunch at my place. 
the word irresistible comes to mind when we think about Zach taking money from enemy. He could not stop himself. Money was irresistible. By the end of the story, something else was irresistible, and that was Jesus. You see, Zach was a sinner, but he was a very professional sinner. He was stealing and very good at it and getting rich from it. And can you imagine how gobsmacked he must have been when Jesus knew his name, knew where to find him, and invited him down out of the tree? You see, Jesus was looking for someone who was lost. And then Jack agreed. And not only did he agree to stop doing what he had been doing, he paid everyone back. Now, this isn't just a story from the Bible and from long ago, because Jesus is still making friends and changing people's lives. It doesn't matter if you're big or small, good at sport or bad at sport, an A-plus student or a D-minus student, whether you've got some money or no money, whether you're popular or whether you're picked on. Jesus still wants to be your friend and share your life. Let us pray. Father, help each one of us to recognize if there is any of Zach in us. Help us to make an effort to go to look for Jesus, knowing that he not only knows our name, but he knows where to find us, and he will offer an invitation to us. Help us to recognize the need for a friend like him and to accept the offer that is made to us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Miss Valerie. Um, before uh, the children and young people start their Sunday school lesson, um, there is actually one more thing that I'd like to do during family time. I couldn't resist. Some of you may know the song that goes along with the story that Miss Valerie just uh, told, and there are also some actions to it. So those of you who know the song and know the actions, I'll try to remember what the actions are here. It's a very short song, and it's about Zacchaeus. So again, I'll invite you to stand as we sing a short chorus that relates to the story that Miss Valerie just read. Not sure who enjoyed that more the young people or the older people but I saw the look on your faces so I, I thank you for sharing in that moment um, it's now time for the young people to I don't see miss Nadine oh miss Nadine has some activity sheets for her class So that's happening. Miss Nadine is organizing her class, and Miss Valerie has a day off. 
which is wonderful, but because Miss Valerie deserves a day off. As we prepare to go before God in prayer, we, let us remain seated as we sing together our prayer chorus, In my life, Lord, be glorified. Father, we bow before you this morning to worship and adore you. We pray that in our church, you will be glorified. We pray that you will strengthen our innermost being and fill our hearts with faith. We pray this morning that we will be rooted and grounded in Christ, whose love is beyond all knowledge. Help us comprehend even the smallest part of the beautiful mystery of your grace and grant that we may experience the fullness of your presence with us as we gather here to worship you this morning. Lord, this morning we think of all of the things in our lives that we are thankful for. We thank you for the calm, clear waters of summer and the opportunity for many of us to travel and enjoy a break from our busy lives. We thank you for bringing families back together, binding them together in love, we thank you for Reverend Yvette and her leadership within our church and charge during this time of uncertainty. We thank you for your love, your comfort, and your healing. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning as a church family to worship you and fellowship here together. As we gather before you this morning, Lord, we confess our sins to you. Sins that we have committed through acts, as well as sins that we have committed by omission. We confess that at times our faith and belief in you has been weak. Sometimes we have even wondered if you truly exist. We confess that sometimes when we look at ourselves, we have been ashamed and have felt unworthy of your love and your forgiveness. Sometimes we have felt the loneliness, despair, and emptiness of a life lived apart from you and yet, Lord, you seek us out, you hear our cries, you offer us refuge and strength and love and forgiveness. And so this morning, Father, we acknowledge our sins to you and ask your forgiveness. We pray that you will give us oil in our lamps, that you will be the guiding light in our paths of life, that in our lives you will be glorified as we strive to live lives that are realigned with your accountability and integrity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our words of assurance this morning come from 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, before we hear the scripture passage from Mark, uh, there was one other prayer request that we have this morning um, that I omitted earlier. Um, Miss Diana, who worships with us um, and is uh, a part of our leadership team, uh, we got the very sad news this morning. Uh, Sheila received a message from her that she would not be worshiping with us this morning because her sister-in-law, uh, Miss Kay Cole, uh, passed away this morning. 
And so we certainly want to lift up Diana and her family in prayers um, in the weeks ahead. I'll invite Mark to bring us now our scripture passage. Boy, there's a lot of fragrances today. Just enveloping the Spirit of God and smelling that. Today's reading is Ephesians chapter 3, 14 to 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurable more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. As we prepare now to hear uh, the spoken word from Reverend, Reverend Yvette, let us remain seated as we sing our song of preparation, verses 1 and 4. Hear, O my Lord. Lord God, we come to your word knowing that you are very present with us in this place and at this time. May you fill us with your grace and your love, and may our hearts be moved by your Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I thank you, Ms. Valerie, for lifting the gospel reading from Luke, the story of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus lives in so many ways and in so many places. And in fact, the World Council of Churches and some of the large ecumenical bodies now speak about a Zac tax where there is a call for persons or institutions or systems 
that have behaved like the old Zacchaeus to become the new Zacchaeus and to return that which was taken. And the, that reading ties in with the theme realigned with accountability and integrity. But I was led to, to focus that theme out of Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus. Because I believe that the basis for one's approach to accountability and integrity must be love and an understanding of God's love for each of us. I could pontificate about what is accountability or what is integrity, but last Sunday, I said at John Gray, I am a bit weary of these words because over decades, we have been preaching about accountability and the importance of accountability. We have been speaking about that we should live our lives with integrity. And I, be, I believe that those words are now just passing over some people. Because the truth is that there are so many instances where we still see, even amongst us as Christians, a lack of accountability and a lack of integrity. So I had to go beyond that when I looked at all the possible passages for reading this morning. And I, I, I felt led to look at this prayer that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And this is not the first time Paul prays for the elders in Ephesus. If you read Acts 20, verses 17 to 38, you will see that Paul was in Miletus. He was by the beach. And he sent to the Ephesian church and said to them, send the elders. And in that Acts reading, he kneels down and he prays for them. And the truth is that Paul recognized that if there were going to be any transactions towards goodness and faith, it had to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in, in when he writes this particular letter to the church at Ephesus, the marvelous thing is that this letter could be read in any one of the churches, whether the church at Laodicea, the church in Galatia, the church in Thessalonica. He wrote a general letter to the saints, and he was saying to them, I want you to understand this. And thank you, Mark, for reading it so eloquently. Because Paul, Paul drills down. And there, there are three particular things that I, I want to say about this, this, this portion of scripture that Paul offers to us. Because he drills down. And he offers, first of all, a posture for his prayer. There's a physical posture. The text tells us that he says, I bow on my knees. I, I am reasoning with the Father on my knees for you. When one adopts that physical posture of prayer, have you ever prayed on your knees? It means that you have gone to the depth of asking God to meet a particular need. Because most of the time, how do we pray? What is the posture for our prayer? We sit, we may stand, we may be driving, we may be cooking, we may be doing some other things, and in our minds we are praying. But when a mother is desperate for a child, when, when a father is, is in need of employment, when someone has a, a, has a diagnosis, an illness, when there is no sophistication about what is happening in your life, your posture is to kneel and to ask God sincerely. And kneeling in prayers are often accompanied by what? Tears. And there is a full flush praying that takes place. It doesn't mean that if we stand to pray or if we're doing something and praying in our minds that God doesn't hear. But attention is drawn when one gets into that posture. It's a posture of humility. It's a posture which says, I cannot do anything else. I'm at the end of my own understanding of my situation. Dear God, please help me. So Paul tells the church that I have adopted a physical posture, not on his own behalf, because it's, it's now intercess, it, and it, a prayer of intercession. 
He is now interceding for Christians. He's now saying to them, the Ephesians, or to the church of that era, and he's also saying to us, I bow on my knees. I am on my knees before God. But he ties it with a sociological understanding of why he is praying. He says, I am praying to the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. So Paul brings to the fore an understanding that we're all one blood. We're all one in Christ Jesus. It is from God whom we take our name. It is from God who we take our identity. And so this posture of prayer speaks to a sociological reality because in the church at Ephesus, there was this thing whether or not only Jews were Christians or non-Jews, Gentiles, could be Christians. And Paul says, we are all taking our name. And when I kneel down to pray, I'm not just praying for Jews, I'm praying for all people because all people receive their name, their identity, because your name is your identity. Receive your name and identity from God. And so his, his posture then is not just a physical of kneeling, it's a sociological posture. I'm praying for everybody. And then he, it's a historical posture, because here we are 2,000 years later, reading this prayer, understanding this prayer. This prayer has lived through time. So regardless of whether we were the church then or we are the church now, it's a historical prayer that binds us together and an understanding that we are all a part of the family of God, regardless of the generation in which we live. And then the fourth posture is a posture that is spiritual. There is no barrier, there is no demarcation. We all belong to Christ once we confess Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. So it, it just in the first, I'd say, verse of this, this portion of Scripture, this pericope, Paul is given to us a particular posture with four demarcations, a physical, sociological, historical, and spiritual posture that you and I need to take under consideration. When we pray, what is our posture? Who do we pray for? Are we just regulated to pray for those we know and love, or do we have space within our prayer for the unknown? I'm always fascinated by the statue of the unknown soldier or the grave marker. We may not know the individual, but we certainly know that someone is suffering or someone has died or someone is in a need. And we, therefore, inter, in an intercessory way, can remember others, can pray for others, can adopt that, that posture which invites others into the space of prayer. I want to also say that Paul just didn't have a posture of prayer but there's a pastoral nature about Paul's prayer. Paul was very concerned about the church. And he took on this pastoral presence among the church, and particularly in this reading for the church in Ephesus. And you might be thinking in your mind, remember who Paul is. It's the new Saul. It's the Paul who, when he was called Saul, persecuted the very church that he now prays for. He is the man who was on the road to Damascus with letters to say that all who name the name of Christ or all who belong to the way, which was what the, the Christians were called before we read in Acts 15, I believe, where it says that they were called Christians in Antioch. This is the Paul who was, as what was the modern word, gung-ho to destroy the church. This is the Paul who now becomes pastoral in his approach and in his nature. And in his pastoral prayer, he intervenes on behalf of the people 
and he invites God's intervention. And he says that I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you. The language of a pastor. Bringing the people before God and asking God out of God's riches to strengthen you, to encourage you. And he says, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you and I are the beneficiaries of this prayer. That through the power of God's Holy Spirit, we might be strengthened in our own prayer life, in our own social life, in who we are as individuals and in how we express ourselves. You can imagine, if I may just pull in a little bit of, of the story of Zacchaeus, modernized so well by, by Ms. Valerie. But you can imagine the life of Zacchaeus before he encountered Christ, before he became someone in whom the Spirit dwelled, before he had an understanding that he was dwelling in sin, and before he knew what it meant to be in a relationship with Christ. Paul prays for us. Because even sometimes within the church, we are still the old Zacchaeus or we are still the old Saul. And we need to come into that place where we understand that God's grace is sufficient. That God's glorious riches are available to strengthen us. To redeem us. To hear our names being called by him. And to exist with him through the power of the Holy Spirit in a place of love and grace and peace. And we want to remember that because our service is, is carried over the internet, I, when I speak, I'm not just speaking to you within the confines of the church, but to a wider audience, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 more persons who met sometime watch this, that our lives must be so embedded in Christ that we have an understanding of what it means to dwell in his presence and to allow the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. You're not here because of your own doing. You're here because you have been led by the Holy Spirit. You have been called by the Holy Spirit into a space of worship. And in this space, the transaction between you and God will take place. That God calls each of us by name. And he knows us. And the greatest thing about our being able to be accountable to God and to live with integrity is that God loves us. And if he so loves us, he forgives us and he enables us to love him and in turn to love others. So you and I can, with compassion and with a deep sense of love, be accountable at all times to God. We need not scheme. We need not devise any plans. Just live that clean and good life because of our love for God. Not because of the law. Not because we don't want to be a headline somewhere. Not because we don't wish to be incarcerated, but because we love God. And if we love God, we must do what? Love others as we love ourselves. So you and I are not operating on the law, but we're operating on the grace. We're operating under the love of Christ who offers us his free grace. And so Paul brings that pastoral nature to this prayer for the church in Ephesus. And therefore, you and I can function as persons for whom accountability and integrity not a problem. No one should be able to say of any one of us that we have ever functioned 
with a question mark over what we do. Because we love God and our lives are filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The third thing I want to say, so it's not just a posture of prayer or the pastoral nature of, God, of Paul's prayer, but I want to speak just a little bit about the purpose of the prayer. Why was this prayer so important? Or I could say, what was the destination of the prayer? And I want to posit that part of it, or maybe all of it, is a sense of Christ living in our inner being. What we show on the outside ought to be a reflection of what is going on in, on the inside. But sometimes I, I struggle with that concept because sometimes many of us are able to disguise. And so what we see on the outside appears good. <laughs> Got a couple of comments about the plumb line sermon. Um, some of us appear good and aligned. You know, we, the plumb line is there, we're aligned, but sometimes that is a disguise because there's a turmoil in the inner being, in the inner soul. The soul is not at peace. I want to say that if Christ is truly dwelling within us, our inner being is transformed. And Paul puts it in the words of the prayer. He says that we must be rooted and grounded in our faith. You know, I think it was in Hurricane Grace, and I saw a little bit of it in Hurricane Ivan. In Ivan, I don't know how many of you, and even along South Sound Road, realized that the Casarina trees fell. You remember that? These tall, elegant trees, they fell. And when, when you look at the root system, what was the issue? Thin. Didn't go deep. In Grace, two years ago, that little storm that took down all the Poinciana trees, when I looked at this large poinciana tree, and I saw more than one, I realized that the root system suggests that it was shallow. Some of us are like that. We look good. We stand tall. But if we're not grounded in Christ Jesus, after a while, we'll fall over. And I want to say to us this morning, our spiritual drilling down must be of such that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That no matter what comes our way, because we, our roots go deep into the soil of God's love and the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing can shake us. And this is the point Paul was trying to make to the church that if you're going to understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, your love for Christ must be deep. And when your inner experience with God is deep and well, your outer experience with others reflect that. So you're not just an empty, shallow Christian who have the phraseology of the faith, the language of the faith, but you have the actions that follow the faith. So when someone says of you, you are rooted and grounded in Christ, they must be able to see inside out what your relationship with God is like. Because after a while, you can't fake it. You know, they have this, this, is it a modern saying, fake it till you make it? I don't believe that. I believe that if you are in Christ, you're a new creature, all things pass away, and behold, all things become new. And you're rooted and grounded you're rooted and grounded in the vastness of the love of Christ. Paul says that we should comprehend or understand the breadth, the depth, and the height. Coming out of this reading from Ephesians, of, of that love of God in Christ Jesus. God loves you. 
And because God loves you, your life is hidden in Christ and your life reflects his glory. I, I love the, the, the last um, verse there. He says, no to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. So, so the glory, the glory is with us because of what Christ is doing. And I'm using the present tense, is doing within each of us. Because when we can grasp that love, how wide or long or high or deep is the love of Christ, and we know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we might be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. What a prayer. And you and I are invited into this, this space and this time so that when we, when we call for accountability and integrity, as I've said, I don't need to tell you the meaning of those words or to or to itemize the ways in which we lack integrity or we lack accountability. This sermon is not about an, a list, but this sermon rather is to talk about when we are in Christ, we are new creatures and all things pass away and behold, all things become new. We are changed. We are changed. And so God in Jesus Christ offers to us his love, which is different from the worldly sophistication, which is different from the worldly values, that that love is deep and that love is patient. And I, I ask you, how much are you willing to give up for the love of Christ within you? Last, last Saturday, when I visited the camp, a young man gave his testimony. And he said that, as you know, during the camp, one day the campers visited different persons in the community. Or old Miss Effie received a visit from, and Miss Ivor received a visit from some of the campers. And I'm not sure which home this young man visited. But he said the older person said to the group, Christ gave up, Christ shed his blood for us. He died on the cross. For what would you shed your blood? And when he said those words, the campers were riveted. And so was I. Because it says to me, what would I be willing to sacrifice? in the way Christ sacrificed for me. And I don't want to shed my blood cheaply by being a person that lacks integrity or accountability, but rather to so love Christ that I can join with the psalmist and say that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So Paul wrote this letter of love and this prayer of love where he offered a posture, a posture that was prayerful physically, socially, historically, and spiritually. And he offered a prayer that was pastoral in nature, then he offered a purpose and a destination for the prayer and the great possibilities for our lives when our lives are rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning for our prayers... We come to intercede for Carolyn Jervis, Sophia Tobut, Amelia.
we come to intercede for the family of Kate as they grieve. And we pray, Lord God, that you would be with them. We pray for the family of Joan Macfield as they too mourn the loss of a mother, grandmother, a daughter of Christ, a servant of God. We pray, God, that for those who are sick and suffering, you may be with them. We pray for those who are grieving, that they'll hear the words of Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We pray, Lord God, that within our own lives we might reflect your glory in all that we do, and that you would gather us up in your love, and that you would pour out your spirit to dwell deeply within us. We pray for the world and those who lead the nations of the world. May they hear your call for love, for peace, for grace, for integrity and accountability. May they hear your call for equity, to make sure that all of us can live and survive in a world where each is recognized as a child of God. We pray, Lord God, for your church. Your church sometimes broken and fragmented, but your church that must be the body of Christ and we continue to pray for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. May your peace dwell within the sanctuary. May your peace dwell within our hearts, in our homes, and in the places we traverse. And may your peace bring healing and comfort to all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we bring our service to a close, I'll invite you to stand if you're able to, as we join together in singing a song that reminds us that we are bound together by our faith, that if we love God, we are called to love others. We are one in the Spirit.
Let's pray. Now, Lord, as we enter into the community, into our homes, into the world, may we serve you with love and with grace. And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone.